Take the distress out of dining. Now introducing a revolutionary new way to enjoy your favorite meals alone. With the cutting edge technology of the TV dinner prepackaged meal, there's absolutely no need for you to go to the market, cook meals, or even sit at the dinner table. Indeed, everything you need for maximum nutrition and fortification can be found within the walls of this plastic tray. As electromagnetic radiation heats your meal, think about all of the human interactions that you were spared from, all of the time that you're saving. Speaking of time, it's dinner time. This is the future. This is the evolution of the human experience. This is what you've always wanted. All you've ever... Well, welcome again to Pathfinder and to our series, A Life Less Lonely. Today, uh, we're actually gonna start with some words from Jesus in a teaching he gave in Matthew chapter six. Um, and he started off that section this way. He, he said these words, and when you pray, We'll get to the rest later, but today I wanted to start us with a question. When do you pray? Uh, let's, do a, let's do a quick survey. Uh, how many of you pray at night before bedtime? Yeah, surefire cure for insomnia, isn't it? Like, I can't sleep. Dear God, in heaven. you're like, you're out, you're out. At least that's how it is for me. Any, anyone first thing in the morning, prayers? Yeah, a bunch of you. There's a pastor I really respect who says that before he lets his feet touch the floor in the morning, he has a Bible on his nightstand, he, he gets up, he grabs his Bible, he reads some verses of scripture, he prays, and then he gets up. And I, I admire that. I just know I need my coffee first before I can understand or say anything. Um, how, how many of you have, uh, have a, a discipline of praying before mealtimes? Yeah, it's a good prompt, a good reminder. Or um, how many of you pray on your commute? On the way in, yeah, just don't close your eyes when you do it. You can pray with your eyes open or maybe on your morning walk. Uh, how many of you will be praying October 9th with us? How many of you just signed up this morning? And if you didn't, you're about to, right? 40 days of prayer. You will be praying hopefully daily with us. See, chances are that, that maybe you don't have a daily rhythm of, of praying. When I'm asking these questions, you're like, yeah, maybe, kind of, sometimes, Maybe you take the, the Marvin Gaye approach and if the spirit moves you, you, uh, you pray. Namely, you pray in moments when you are in trouble, right? When your back's against the wall, when you're anxious, when you're worried about something, when you're laying awake in bed at night and you can't sleep. Um, maybe it's those kinds of moments. And uh, back to Jesus' point, I think his point in starting off this section and when you pray is an acknowledgement. It's not if you pray, it's when. Pretty much everyone at some point in their life will find themselves in a moment where they're, where they're praying regardless of their theology. We see this in TV and on the movies, right? There's that old saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. That there are moments in life where you are, you're so driven out of a place of need or desperation where wh whoever you are, whatever you believe, you will pray. The question is, to whom? Uh, how often? Under what circumstances? When do you pray? And if for you, the, the answer again is like, gosh, I don't, I don't feel like I pray as often as I feel like I should, or I don't pray as much as I would like to. Um, here's what I think. The reason prayer is such a struggle for us today is because we have more things under our control than ever before. We've got money in our bank accounts and a relative amount of wealth to deal with that, that helps us in a lot of situations. But we've got all kinds of other things. When I get in my car, I, I can see before I ever start my drive to work that there's an accident five miles ahead on my normal route. Just a few years ago, you didn't know that. I mean, if the you caught the traffic guy at the 15s of the hour on the radio, maybe, but otherwise you're, you're just in traffic and you're stuck and you have no control. Now, now we can see that five miles ahead, there's an accident. I can reroute myself. I, I can still get to work on time. That's new. Or if the weather's extreme, we've got these great thermostats and HVAC systems where you can keep it, a, at least in my house, a balmy 75 degrees all summer. I live with a woman who's chronically cold. I don't mind because I'd rather keep my money than give it to Ameren. Um, 
but I don't even need to go to my thermostat anymore. I don't know about you, I can just do that for my phone. Like I can mess with my family. I can cook them if I want um, while sitting here at church. Right, or, or in times of drought, and it's been a really dry season for us, I can cause waters to spring forth from the earth. Called my irrigation system. I, I can keep things watered. If there's a blight that kills all of the raspberries and I can't find any at my local grocery store, I can get online, I can get some shipped from California or Serbia. Did you know that Serbia is the top three producer of raspberries in the world? I did not until this week. So if you need raspberries and California doesn't have any, go get them from Serbia. See, see the thing is, we're living in this world where we have, we have control over so many aspects of our lives. Even the weather doesn't get in our way. We, we, can, we can overcome so much. And the more we feel like we've got control over things, the more that promotes the illusion that we are in control. Now, you may be thinking, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, although there may be a lot of things that are in our control, the reality is we, we are not in control of anything. We'll talk about this in a minute. But living a life where we, we imagine that we're in control, a life of self-reliance, well, while you technically can get away with it most of the time, that doesn't mean it's a healthy way for you to live. Um, there's a hidden cost to living life that way, trying to be in control, trying to be self-reliant all the time. It doesn't mean that it's wise to live that way just because you can. In the same way that if you're staying in a hotel room and you've got leftover pizza the next morning from a, from a night and you don't have your, your air fryer with you or your microwave, you can technically reheat the pizza using a clothing iron and a hair dryer. <laughs> you can. I wouldn't advise it, especially if you have to iron your shirt later. It wouldn't be a, a good idea. Or uh, this winter, if your furnace goes out, you could heat your house this way. Turn on all the burners, fan on low. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Or if you're, if you're you know, you, you get a cup and it won't fit in your cup holder. This one's kind of grainy. You, you could use a work boot. Just make sure the work boot's clean. I wouldn't want my mouth that close to my boot. I don't know about that. Or, or you know, if, you, if you're at a summer barbecue and you want to stay in the pool, Now, here's what scares me about this. This looks like a college. And I'm like, please tell me these young men have not gone to college and don't know that this is a really dumb idea, that water and electricity do not mix cooking taquitos over there or whatever they got in the pool. Right? You, you can do things, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. It doesn't mean it's wise. It doesn't mean that there's not a cost or a danger associated with it. And these lives that we live of trying to be in control, trying to be self-reliant, while well, we technically can and we've got resources and we've got technology that enables us to do it, there is a cost. And the cost is not only prayerlessness, the cost is disconnection. And, and you see, one of the kindest things that God can do for us, one of the best things that can happen to us is, is sometimes our worst nightmare. It's moments where God allows us to be in a situation where our resources are exhausted, when all of our life hacks fail, when you, you've got nothing left, you've got nowhere else to turn. Those moments can be powerful moments to help us live differently, to live richer lives. And, and we'll talk about this in a second. But first, I just want you to take a moment and I want you to... Think about a moment in your life recently where you were in those circumstances. A moment in your life where your resources were exhausted, your life hacks failed, you had nowhere else to turn, you, you were in trouble, you were in need. Maybe it's a relationship that went hay haywire and you did what you could to repair it and, and, it, and it didn't work. You couldn't do anything else or a medical issue you couldn't fix or maybe it's some sort of natural disaster that didn't ask your permission or respect your boundaries before it upended your life. I want you to think for a second about when was the last time you were driven to your knees. And in my life, there, there have been some really big moments even recently, some smaller moments when we just feel powerless. My daughter calls me from California and says she's been in a minor car accident or something's wrong with her car and I'm like, what am I supposed to do from here? Or how, or something breaks and I don't have the resources to fix it, either the know-how or the money, but, but it's also the big stuff in life. Just think about what that is for you. Think about a recent moment. Just sink into that moment for a second and I want you to 
really tap into what that felt like for you. What words would you use to describe that moment? In fact, go ahead, go ahead. If you got a word, shout it out. What did it feel like to be in that place? Hopeless? I, I missed it still. Anxious, helpless, I, I think I'm hearing. What else? Louder? Horrible? I don't know if I got that right or not, but it, I would say that would feel horrible to me. What else? Angry. Angry. <laughs> yeah. Man. Distressed. Distressed. Mad. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, in that moment, if you can remember that moment, did, did you pray? My guess is you probably did. Maybe not first. I, I know I'll like just keep wearing myself out, exhausting all my hands, and I'll be like, oh, I, maybe, maybe I should pray. I imagine that many of you did. And if you did, you might have even felt a sense of guilt about that. Like, oh, here I am again, God. I'm, 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 I'm here just asking when I need something, and, and I should be showing up more often, but now I'm in trouble, and so I'm asking for your help. But really, there's no shame in those moments, because the moments, those moments are important teachers for us. Those moments show us that the, the truth is we are always more out of control and reliant, not self-reliant, but other reliant than we think. James, the brother of Jesus, wrote this in his letter. It's a part of the New Testament. He said, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go into this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. You're making all these plans. Why? You do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. I mean, James doesn't mince words here about the way that we're trying to live our lives with all of this planning and thinking we're in power and control. He says, that's arrogant, that's boasting, that's evil. And what I think he means is it's dangerous. It's not healthy for us to live life this way. It's lonely. It comes at a great cost. Now, there's a, there's a footnote to, I think, what James is saying, what I've been talking about. I just want to be clear about this. Control is not the same thing as agency. When we lose control, it's important that we, we know that we still have a sense of agencies, something we call agency. Uh, I think to understand what agency is, if you don't know this word, Viktor Frankl, the Vienna psychiatrist, concentration camp survivor in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he describes agency in this way. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own Way. He says, no, you know what, when everything is out of your control, and this is a guy reflecting on his time in a concentration camp where everything is out of your control, he says, you still, even when you've lost all control, you still have something called agency. You still have the power to decide, the power to choose what your attitude will be. You have the power to choose how you'll respond to situations that are spiraling out of control. You have the power to choose what meaning you will give to the things that you are experiencing a lack of control does not mean a lack of agency. We all need a sense of agency in our lives. We need to know that, that we still have choices even when everything is out of our control. But one of the helpful things that happens to us in life when we are out of control, it's a great moment for us. It's a gift from God when he brings us to these moments when everything is out of our control. Then we have the choice to see the difference between these two and to exercise our agency to do one of the most helpful things a person can do. We pray, we pray. When do you pray? I don't know what it looks like for you, whether it's a daily ritual, uh, hour by hour ritual, or, or whether it's just when you're in trouble. The reality is we all pray. And Jesus wants to teach us now how to pray. So here, here's what he says in the rest of Matthew chapter six, starting at verse five. And when you pray, because we all will, 
First of all, here's what not to do. Here's how not to do it. Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees, it's not for the gallery, it's for your father who sees what is done in secret. He will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, now Jesus, before he tells us how to pray, gives us a couple of warnings about how not to pray. The first thing he says is that prayer should never be a performance, which feels a little scary being a guy who's often asked to be a professional prayer. You're like, Pastor, will you say the blessing before the wedding banquet? And right, the temptation is, well, I better say something nice. They spent a lot of money on this dinner, right? There's a danger with thinking that prayer is a performance meant to impress other people. Jesus says that's not what the purpose is. It's not a demonstration to, to get other people to think you're eloquent and amazing. It's, it's not a demonstration of your righteousness. That prayer should never be a performance. The other thing he says, and this one, man, we gotta be, all got to pay attention to this one. Uh, he says that prayer must not be a means to try to regain control when we've lost it. Hear me? Prayer must not be an attempt to regain control when we've lost it. And yet that's what prayer so easily and quickly can turn into. I'm in trouble. Things aren't going my way. God, I need you to make things go my way again. And we think with the right right words, with the right formula, with the right confidence, I can make things happen the way I want. Jesus says that's the opposite of what prayer is. In fact, in the Bible, do you know what it's called when people try to harness supernatural powers or the powers of nature to get what they want? It's called witchcraft or sorcery. Now, I don't consider myself a witch or a sorcerer, but I have prayed that way sometimes. And, and chances are you have too. Where we think prayer, the point of prayer is that I can leverage God, a God of power, to do what I want, but understand what that is. That's still keeping me in the driver's seat. That's still keeping me in control. Now I've got God working for me like I'm carrying around a a shiny lamp that I can rub and make a genie come out and make him do what I want. I I remember 20 years ago when my grandfather died suddenly. He was 71 years old. He died in a car accident. He was in great health, but uh, he died suddenly. And and I knew in that moment, not only did I lose my Papa JT, who I love deeply, but I knew in that moment that my dad's really broken family was pretty fractured. I knew that everything was going to fall apart now that my papa was gone, because he was the glue. You know, families like this or people like this. I mean, he was the glue who held the family together. And sure enough, 20 years later, yeah, just everything, everything fell apart without him. But, but I just remember being so grieved in the aftermath of hearing that uh, he had died, that, that, that I, I you know, was desperate. I, I came to a moment of prayer and, and I remember praying to God and I remember just thinking, if I could just find the right words, if I could find the right formula, If I pray in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, if I can conjure up in myself enough faith, because Jesus says, if if you have enough faith, you can tell the mountain to jump into the heart of the sea. And and if I could just find that within myself, I could could make God bring him back. It wasn't too long. It hadn't been, I mean, Lazarus was in the grave for three days, four days, and maybe I could do that. Jesus says, "That's, that's not what prayer's for. That's not how we should pray. Again, God is not your genie. We all know how those genie stories work out for the holder of the lamp. It never works out good. It's not good when we try to put ourselves in control and leverage divine power to work for us. See, Jesus says, how do you pray? Well, you don't pray trying to be impressive or to put on a show for other people. And he says, you don't pray to try to regain control when you've lost it. That's the antithesis of prayer. Instead, here's what he says. Here's what he says. Here's how you should pray. This then is how you should pray. And you should recognize these words, or at least they should seem somewhat familiar to you. Our Father in heaven, right? He's not an uncaring deity. He's your father. You're his daughter. You're his son. You're you're talking to someone who knows you and loves you. Hallowed be your name. There's no one like you. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, not my ways, but your ways. Not our ways, not our plans, God, but your 
plans. Give us today our daily bread. God, God, save me from scarcity thinking where I think it's all on me to provide for myself and to put food on the table. Remind me that you're my provider. Forgive our debts. God, remind me, show me that I don't need to be perfect in order to qualify for your love because you're a God who is gracious. So help me be gracious to those who have sinned against me and forgive them. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I don't have to fall victim to fear and self-preservation. God is my guide. He's ahead of me. He's behind me. He's walking with me because all power and glory and honor and authority belongs to him. Do you see, do you see the point of this prayer? It's, it's not even so much about the words, but, but do you see the attitude Jesus is trying to bring us to? He says, he says when you pray, the purpose, the point is to surrender, to lay down your control and your self-reliance and to call upon the, the one, a, a God who is good, who loves you, who knows you and will always take care of you. Jesus is saying that the point of prayer is to relax into reliance. I love the way that Eugene Peterson puts it. Eugene Peterson uh, passed away a couple of years ago, just faithful pastor, and he started translating the Bible from the original languages for his congregation just to help them understand like the heart of what scripture meant. And that later became a translation of the Bible called the message translation. And, uh, and, and here's the same thing that we just looked at, Matthew 5, same verses. Uh, but here's Eugene Peterson's translation on it. I love this. Talking about prayer again. What's the point? How do we pray? And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for 15 minutes of fame. Do you think God sits in a box seat and is going to applaud you in that way? Instead, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God. And you'll begin to sense his grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with. And he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this. Our father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best as above, so here below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Isn't that awesome? I, I love that. Now, now, here's the question What if we didn't have to wait? for life to bring us to our knees, to have this revelation, to discover a deeper connection with God, to discover what it looks like to rely on God. What if we didn't have to wait for life to, to break us down, to live each day with a healthy sense that we are, we are always out of our league, we are always under resource for the task that's ahead of us? That we are hopeless and lost without God, yes, but also that God is so good, he's such a loving father, and he knows us so well that we'd be fools not to entrust ourselves to his care and his control because he's wiser, he's better, he's more loving, he's for us, he's with us. Why not live life that way every day rather than those moments when, when life brings us to our knees? I can tell you why, because some of us still, including me, don't like the idea of being powerless. But here's the thing, and I hope you can begin to see this, that what Jesus is inviting us into is prayer, in prayer is a revolutionary source of power. Because when you surrender your control and your sense of self-reliance, here's what you find, that there's one holding you. You can relax into reliance on him, and the world is no longer yours to carry. See, I don't care how tough and bad and in power you think you are and how much you like being in charge. The reality is it's heavy to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, isn't it? Do you ever get tired of it? 
Do you ever ever get tired of feeling like it all depends on you and you've got to perform at this level and you've got to show up with this kind of energy and and, and you've got to be the one who's the backstop and if you don't do it, no one else will and if you don't show up, then everything's going to fall apart and fall through the cracks and people are going to get hurt and... Does that ever wear you down? Are you tired of carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders? See, if you are, just remember that you you were never meant to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. That was never the plan. And that's why Jesus came down literally to carry the weight of the world for you. To prove to you that it's not yours to carry, it never was. So he literally, he carried a cross on his shoulders as, as, as proof that not only are you not expected to carry the weight of your own mistakes and failures and sin and shame, he's taking that from you, but, but you especially don't have to carry the weight of the world. He's got it on his shoulders. The burdens of the planet were placed on him, not on you. See, see that's the gift of relinquishing control, of relinquishing self-reliance, of being brought to our knees, whether by life or just willingly to fall onto our knees and surrender. This, this is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul said, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Look at this again. I delight in moments when I'm weak, when I'm insulted, when I'm suffering, when I'm persecuted, when I'm experiencing hardship. What is this guy talking about? Well, well, I think what Paul is talking about is that he had the same problem that we do. He's a competent guy. He's in charge of a lot. And so he learned to glory in these moments when he was brought to his knees, when his power failed him, when his smarts failed him, when he, when he had no control over his circumstances because he realized that in those moments of utter weakness, when he was broken and surrendered, then Christ's power was truly strong in him, that when he was weak, then he was strong. These moments when God brings us to our knees, they're they're gifts for us. They don't feel like it, but, but they really are. But instead of waiting for God to bring us to our knees over and over and over again, why not learn from those moments and make reliance a daily part of our practice. Like, like we sung here today, just saying, God, I need you. My God, my God, I, I, God, I need you. I need you now. See, this is what prayer begins to do for us. It, it reframes the whole way that we move through the world, how we think the world works, the expectations and the burdens that we carry, whether those give us a sense of pride and ego or, or whether they, they bring us to our knees with their crushing weight. And if we understand prayer this way, not only is it a revolutionary source of power in our lives, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. God's power is working through me and and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All of that's true. But if we can understand prayer in this way, it also becomes a revolutionary source of connection. Not just between us and God, but between us and us, between one another. Part of the reason we struggle to connect with each other, the reason we live these lonely lives is because we don't wanna have to rely on anyone else, right? In our modern world, to rely on someone else, it feels like a failure. And, And if we struggle to rely on God, how much more are we gonna rely, or struggle to rely on other people? See, prayer has the power to change our whole approach to life. If, if we can just learn to let go of self-reliance in every aspect, here's what we'll find. We'll find deeper connection. Now, I don't know about you. I, I try to avoid asking for help whenever I can. <laughs> I hate asking for help. And I tell myself it's because I don't want to inconvenience every, anyone else that people got other burdens in their life and they got struggle and they're busy and I don't want to bother them. I don't want to take you know, them away from their stuff to burden them with my stuff. But the reality is, the truth is, I like to maintain my illusion of control. It's threatening to my ego to have to be a person who asks for help. And so as I was sitting here working through this message, realizing that I'm I'm so guilty of this, I thought, you know what I need to do to close this message? I need to think of a story where I, uh, you know, I, I, 
cause myself to do the thing that was hard for me to do and I was in trouble and I reached out to someone and I asked them for help and they came and it was painful for me but it was actually really good and I learned a lesson. I spent all week trying to think of a story like that and I couldn't think of one. And I'm sure they exist. I just <laughs> they don't happen very often in my life. Instead, I kept thinking of stories that were the exact opposite. I thought about the moment lots of years ago where I had to get an emergency appendectomy and I, uh, I drove myself to the hospital for it and Jocelyn was like, should I come up to be a partner? I'm like, no, just stay home. You know, the kids were young and we didn't have anyone. We were kind of still new to town. We didn't have anyone that we felt like we could burden to come watch our kids so that she could come to the hospital with me and I'm like, I'll, I'll be fine. And they're wheeling me into surgery and the surgeon is there in the OR and he says, all right, Dion, who's with you today? And in my mind, I didn't know what the question meant. So I just went back to Sunday school and I was like, Jesus? <laughs> and he was like, no, I mean, who's, who's waiting in the waiting room? And I was like, oh, oh, well, no one, no one. My, my wife's at home with her kids, you know, like it's no big deal. He's like, well, can I at least get a phone number so I can call her and let her know how, how the surgery went? I think she would want to know that. I think about other moments in life where I was loading or unloading furniture that was technically way too heavy for me to carry and advisable for me to do, and yet I tried to do it anyway. I, I could think of tons of stories like that of, of me just holding on to a sense of self-reliance to my illusions of control at all costs. I couldn't think of a story where I just willingly was like, hey, come, come help. But I'll tell you what I did think of. I thought of stories when people, without my permission, without my asking, broke through my walls of self-reliance and saw that I was in need, saw that I was in over my head and came and helped me anyway. I remember 14 years ago, we, we moved houses, but we just moved two houses over. We were renting a house and we bought a house two doors down. And I thought, no big deal. We're, we're just literally walking things from one house to the other. I don't need any help moving. We can just, we can do this on our own. And a coworker rallied all of her family and friends and they just showed up at my house uninvited to help us move. And I think about a group of guys who did the same thing when I was installing hardwood floors in my house. I, I knew how to do it. I didn't need their help. I was ready to do it all on my own. But man, I'll tell you, it sure went quicker <laughs> because they helped. And just for the record, I could have done it all on my own. I didn't need them. <laughs> or I think just even within the last year, as my coworkers here I really stepped up when I was brought to my knees by the loss of my best friend, and even while they were hurting, they, uh, they, they just took the burden from me and they were like, we, we've got it, we've got it. We'll make sure church is okay. And even though I didn't ask for those moments, I didn't invite them in, even in those moments when people violated my boundaries and, and they just did the thing, I'll tell you what happened. I learned there's something beautiful about relying on other people. I, I learned there's something humbling but good and connecting when we can own that we are not as in control of things as we think. You know, my blood family over the course of my life, they've, they've been there for me through a lot of things, but in, in a way your blood family, they're kind of supposed to do that, right? And, uh, and my blood family, they live, they live far away. I'll tell you, the most I've learned about surrendering control and self-reliance have happened right here in my family of faith. And I think that's God's point. I think that's the reason God calls us together to be a body together, not just so that we can you know, sit in seats near each other, but, but I think he's calling us to really learn that even people who are not related to you, people who you don't know for any other reason than your brothers and sisters in Christ, that those are people you can learn to rely on, those are people who care for you, that together we can move through life together, carrying one another's burdens, carrying each other's loads, and it's a better way to live. Yeah, you can live the other way. You can heat up a piece of pizza on a clothing iron with a hairdryer in a hotel room but there's a better way, there's a better way. And I think it's why what we do as church is so, so important. So church, today I wanna to call us again to a metanoia moment. If you remember this from a couple of weeks ago, metanoia is a word that means repentance, that just means to turn around, to draw a line in the sand and to act differently. 
And so today I want to invite you to, to a metanoia moment. I want to invite you along with me just, just to say to yourself, and, and, and you won't do this perfectly, but just make the declaration in your heart today that you are not going to do the self-reliance bit anymore. I'm not going to do it. And so the next time you're carrying something that is too heavy for you, whether that's literally or, or metaphorically, I want you to remember this moment and say, I'm not going to do the self-reliance bit anymore. And I want you to reach out to someone, whether it's a friend or an acquaintance or even a stranger who might be available to help you and ask for help. It may seem like worse than death itself to have to put yourself in that position and acknowledge your loss of control and to rely on someone. I think you'll find life in it. And not only that, whatever your prayer life has been up to this point, even if you, you only are a, a foxhole kind of prayer, you only pray when things are really, really bad, I'm inviting you today to start a regular rhythm. And I'd encourage you to do this in the morning before time gets too busy, where you turn to your Father in heaven. And, and remember, you don't have to put on a show, and it's not about the eloquence of your words or the right formula. It's just about surrendering. It's about learning to rely on someone other than yourself. I'm, in, I'm inviting you to turn to God daily and to say, Father, I don't even know what today holds, but I know I need you. God, I need you. That's enough. Now, we'll, we'll of course be uh, praying together starting on October 9th, but, but don't wait until then. God, I need you every day. Or, or maybe if, if that doesn't work for you, Jesus gave us words to pray today. And in fact, that's how I want us to close our time. Um, the words for the Lord's Prayer that we often pray together out loud in cadence will be on the screen. We're not going to pray it out loud. Instead, uh, we're going to take a little more time with these phrases. And, and I simply want you to sit with God and use these as prompts to pray whatever they bring up in you. But most of all, use these as prompts. Hear them as an invitation to unburden yourself from the weight of the world and to turn to a God who loves you, who's, who's all-powerful and completely good, and to let him carry the burdens. Use these, as, use these as prompts to allow your heart, to connect your heart to greater reliance on him. Lord's Prayer, take these prompts. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our online Pathfinder community. If you're new, you can find helpful links to resources in the description below or at pathfinderstl.org. And while you're there, you can also find our message podcasts, which allow you to listen to the weekend message on the go. If this service was a blessing to you, spread the news and bless others. Hit that subscribe button, like and comment, and do your part in spreading the life-changing message of Jesus by sharing this video with others. And one more thing before you go. If you'd like to support our ministry with a gift, visit pathfinderstl.org slash give. It's your generosity that fuels our work here at Pathfinder Church. And don't forget, you belong here. We hope to see you next week.